Throughout its 14 year run, Zombies has been the thing that's really helped set the Call of Duty franchise apart from many other first person military shooters for me. And throughout these 14 years, there's been all sorts of experiences across many locations, timelines, and universes. Some good, some bad, and some so terrible the very thought of playing them ever again fills you with that same type of existential dread you get when you're all alone with your thoughts at 4am. Personally, I'm of the mind that every single one of them has something to offer, even if it's something tiny. So today, I want to go through every single map and point out something that I love about them. Whether that's some easter egg, a wonder weapon, or even just a little lore tidbit. Oh, and if some of these picks seem a bit weird, that's because I didn't want to pick the same few things everyone else on the planet would. Not in a hipster kind of way, mind you. More like a, let's not be a broken record kind of way. And another thing, don't be surprised if I have more than one thing for some maps, because I like zombies a very normal amount. Nocturne Totem. Without a doubt, the part of Noct that holds up the best even 14 years later is the environment and the mood. From the dark, gritty visuals, to the creepy environmental sound, to the unique, weird zombie noises that, unfortunately, never came back, few maps have ever been able to capture the sheer spookiness of this one, especially not its various remakes, all of which lost more and more of that original charm until becoming completely unrecognizable by the time we get to D Machina. I understand they were going for something different, but it just cannot compare to World at War Noct. Verukt. Sure, the introduction of power, perk machines, and traps are super cool, and their impact on the series cannot be overstated, but my personal favorite thing to come out of Verukt was the Super Sprinters. For those unfamiliar, Super Sprinter refers to a speed where zombies will catch up to a player if they simply try to walk away from them. They would be completely absent from normal gameplay until finally reappearing in Black Ops 4 Zombies almost a full decade later in an effort to make high rounds more engaging and challenging. And that's why I love them so much. Giving the zombies the ability to rush your stupid ass down really helps shake the game up, especially in the games where they do more damage the higher the round is. It's not much of a difficulty increase, but it certainly is fun, especially here in Verruckt where the CQC design makes it so that your back is almost always pinned to the wall. Shinonuma Verruckt may have introduced the power and perk machines, both of which have become staples of the mode since, but Shinonuma introduced us to what is easily the most iconic cast in the series in Ultimus and one of the most popular wonder weapons to date with the Wunderwaffe DG2. A weapon so iconic, it just keeps coming back over and over and over again, like William Afton Fanf. But unlike Mr. Afton Fanf, I'm always happy to see this thing pop up. Duris. Yet another map that pushed the series forward in a meaningful way. This time, it came in the form of the Pack-a-Punch machine. And with that, came an amazing new camouflage that still ranks among the franchise's best. And when I talk about this camo, I specifically mean the War at War variant. The Black Ops 1 version looks like plastic, and so does the one from Black Ops 2 multiplayer. But this one? Oh. That's beautiful. Kino der Toten. The theater is broken. I love all the creepy little set dressings in this one. There's these weird little zombie pods, a nightmarish destroyed version of Samantha's bedroom, a version of the Wittenau Asylum pre-zombie outbreak, and these. These little film reels. I always love the mystery that these stills built. Especially the one with the zombies coming up the hill that kind of looks like it was taken by a war photographer. I don't know what it is, but something about that one specifically creeped me the hell out as a kid, and is still a bit spooky today as an 84 year old man. 5. The gimmick of fighting zombies in the Pentagon and playing as exaggerated versions of major historical figures like John F. Kennedy and Nixon is just so wonderfully silly. Gentlemen, lock and load. This map is the exact moment Treyarch Zombies changed and gained this fan fiction -y energy it never entirely shook off. Not that I mind, of course. Hell, you should see the amount of AO3 bookmarks I have. Is that something I should be publicly admitting? Probably not. Ascension. It's the basic bitch decision, but I'm still gonna say it. The introduction of quests in zombies. I make fun of these things a lot and will continue to do so since a lot of them are poorly designed messes that kinda overshadow the survival gameplay core. But really, they've done far more good for zombies than bad, and early maps like Ascension really got it right. It's mysterious, not impossible to figure out like some of them, and doesn't overshadow the main experience in any way, shape, or form. You could literally never do this quest and still have a ton of fun with Ascension, but if you wanted to delve deeper into it, you could, and you'd probably have an even greater affinity for the map after finishing it. Call of the Dead. 
The standout of this funny little crossover experience for me were the map's unique wonder weapons. First off, the Scavenger, an explosive sniper rifle that absolutely eviscerates crowds of undead with a single shot. And second, but more interestingly, the VR-11, the first wonder weapon that doesn't downright kill zombies and is instead used as a strategic tool with all sorts of effects, from turning zombies back into humans, to giving teammates temporary insta-kill by shooting them, to even sending George Romero away for a full round. Due to this wide variety of utility, you're probably going to want to keep this thing on you at all times, especially if you hate the nigh-invincible, glorified whistling that is George Romero on this map. Shangri-La the tight CQC style map design of this one hits my sweet spot so well. I've always been more partial to these close quarter maps that make you feel almost claustrophobic. So of course, Shangri-La with its tight winding paths, numerous traps, environmental hazards, and very limited breathing room ended up being one of my all time faves. And this is one of the few maps I feel actually improved in Zombies Chronicles due to the slightly increased speed and aggression of the AI in Black Ops 3. The only complaint I have really is that kicking the baby zombies isn't as fluid as it was in Black Ops 1, but what can you do? What can you do? Moon. No Man's Land would have been the easy thing to go for, but I think the coolest thing about Moon was the main quest. From the initial reveal of Samantha during the cryogenic slumber party quest, to her becoming a playable character towards the end, to the zombies' eyes and announcer changing, and finally, blowing up the earth. This quest was a hell of a ride from start to finish, and left us all wondering where zombies could go next with the Ultimus cast. A cast that would not be playable again for almost seven years. Transit. I know a lot of people hate it, but oh boy, here I go being a contrarian again. I love the fog. The mood it sets is really eerie and helps sell the post-apocalyptic feel the map is going for. Plus, just seeing the blue eye glows of the zombies at a distance is kind of spooky. What can I say? I dig it. Nuketown Zombies. Two things I love here. One, the M27. This is one of my favorites back in the days of Black Ops 2 multiplayer, so I'm glad that it at least got the chance to show up in one map. I still have no idea why they never put it in Black Ops 3 when it's literally right there in the game and finished. And second, I love the plot twist that they stole from Saw 4, where this map actually takes place at the exact same time as its predecessor. It was so cool seeing those zombie eyes turn blue at round 25 and watching the rocket touch down during the game over screen for the first time back in 2012. That was 11 years ago, holy shit. Die Rise. This one was super easy, the upside down arenas. The idea of having play spaces that are upside down or on a slant is something I wish zombies did again someday. Even if it doesn't actually impact the gameplay experience, like in Die Rise, it instantly gives the map a unique aesthetic. Oh, and of course, I don't think a single human being is gonna argue with me on this one. The skybox is fucking beautiful. Mob of the Dead. Can I really only pick one thing? Albert Arlington. I love the way Arlington is used as a stand-in for the audience while also being a well-fleshed-out character on his own. Each time the cycle of the prison repeats, the mobs just forget everything, except for Arlington. He keeps little bits of knowledge, whether it's memories that he mysteriously retains or hints that his past self rode around the prison grounds, and then he uses all that to plan out another attempt. He learns more and more about the prison alongside the audience until it all culminates in learning the truth from Ferguson and the subsequent final battle on the Golden Gate Bridge. Absolutely masterful. Good show, fellas. Buried. Deep underground. I'm gonna keep this one short and simple, letting us place the wall weapons ourselves with a chalk. Why is this feature never returned even once? I'll be the first to admit that it doesn't really do all that much for the gameplay, but it's so cool and gimmicky that I really wish it had showed up a couple more times. It's like the hacker all over again. Origins. Hey, you wanna hear the most basic bitch shit on the planet? I like the stabs. Such an incredibly brave take in a hostile community, I know. While the upgrade quests themselves range from fine to... Ugh, fucking... They're all so fun and powerful that it really helps that horrible part go down a lot easier. On top of their pure effectiveness, they all look great, have really neat designs, and the effects work on them, especially in Black Ops 3, is fantastic. There's a reason why so many maps afterwards tried to replicate the one unique wonder weapon per player thing that this map did. And I'd argue that, to this day, they may have had tons of success with this formula, but they've never done it quite as well as this map did. Outbreak. The conspiracy theory behind multiple endings for main quests and zombies has existed for years, going back as early as transit, if I'm not mistaken. Personally, I just call it copium in the face of lackluster endings. 
Believe me, I've been there, man. But Outbreak actually did have one that people didn't discover for quite a while. If you collect all the key cards in the quest through melee only, you'll actually get a non-canon ending where the Atlas Warbird comes in and everyone safely extracts that issue. Infection. Or is it infected? Call me crazy, but this is my favorite of the Exo-Zombies maps? I wouldn't call it good or even decent, but the reason I prefer it over the others is because of how the map design feels like it was actually built with the exosuit in mind, whereas the others just feel like normal zombies maps with exos thrown in haphazardly at the 11th hour. The spawn room has all these storage shelves, value voltage has a little roof above the pumps, and the entirety of the burger town is wide open. So for the three seconds you're not being harassed by EMZs, you can have a lot of fun with the exosuit. Just a shame about those toxic zones. Carrier. This map is... not good. But it has my absolute favorite special enemy in Zombies history, and it's not even close. The Deep Sea Diver Goliath. This thing only appears if you let all three Atlas Bombs detonate in a single round, and is an absolute unit of an enemy. It moves fast, hits like a truck, destroys distraction drones, and will actively try to avoid gunfire and close the distance for a hit by teleporting around. And it's not like you can just run away from it either. If you get too far away and it has a line of sight of you, it'll launch an EMP missile with surprisingly strong tracking that'll disable your EXO like an EMZ. You have to fight this thing, and you better do it quickly because when the hordes join in, this this thing becomes a fucking nightmare. Thankfully though, the game gives you a bit of a grace window at the start of the round before zombies start spawning in, where it's just you and the Goliath, so chop chop. Just a fantastic enemy on all fronts. Oh, and of course, I couldn't get through Carrier without mentioning Chompy. Look at that little guy go. Descent. Look, I could easily just say the blunderbuss and move on, but I actually adore this map's ending. Having the whole thing be a where are they now styled thing sarcastically narrated by John Malkovich's Oz is a fittingly silly way to end this admittedly silly story. Lennox got promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. He remains a total dick to this day. It is a great ending that wraps up everything in a neat little bow. Until the last shot that ruins the whole thing. Shadows of Evil. This was honestly the hardest one in the entire video, because there's a lot that I really, really love about this one. Jeff Goldblum's whack-ass performance as Nero Blackstone, the jazzy soundtrack, the cute little tiebacks to Mob of the Dead, the unique weapons like the bootlegger, and so, so much more. But the thing I settled on was the expansion of the Zombies universe. Origins kinda started it with the Ancient Templars, but Shadows took it to a whole new level with the introduction of the Keepers, Apothecons, the Shadow Man, which is still a really stupid name, <laughs> Ancient Overlords, a new MacGuffin in the Summoning Key, and even this funny little Scrunkly. Come on, Squidly, let's go cause some trouble. <laughs> Look at him. While I'll be the first to admit that what they ended up doing with these new elements was pretty disappointing, the new stuff this map introduced was super cool. Doris but blue. I love, love, love this map's version of the Wunderwaffe DG2. The model looks great, the effects are fantastic, there's some subtle little tweaks made to the animations that look nice, and the initial impact of the shot will actually stun every zombie around you before electrocuting it. And of course, there's the updated sound design. Yeah, that's pretty wonderful. Oh, wonderful, that's a pun. I didn't even realize that until now. That's great, G good job. Der Eisendraka, a bona fide classic of a map. And for good reason. Great map design, great wonder weapons, and a really neat quest filled with tasteful callbacks. Yet the thing that really stands out to me was that outro where Dempsey has to kill an alternate version of himself. This was the first time zombies really had one of these emotionally affecting moments, and it works really, really well. A lot of people point to good to see you, Tank, as the standout of the scene. And that is great, but I think the decision to not have any more dialogue after he presses the button is really fantastic. No pretentious musings from Richthofen, no cliched reassurances from the rest of the cast, nothing. It's a really effective little moment with a surprising amount of restraint that really sticks with you after playing. Setsubo no Shima. I really like how you get Widow's Wine in this map. Unlike other maps where you just spam the Wonder Fizz until you get it through dumb luck, you actually have to earn this admittedly really powerful perk by defeating a mini boss. While in the grand scheme it's not that big of a deal, it does give the experience a unique flavor. And I'm genuinely kind of surprised they never did it again. The closest thing we had was getting access to the Watchtower with PhD after killing the Abomination of Forsaken. But I don't think that really counts. Garrod Crovey. 
the time trials. If you manage to complete a certain round within a certain amount of time, you'll be awarded with a powerful melee weapon in the armory. I think every map should have something small like this. Extra little challenges that can help extend replayability for when you've already gotten used to the map itself. Now, they're not super impactful by any means, and I forget about them half of my games, but sometimes, they're a fun little challenge to go for, and they emphasize the part of zombies I personally find the most fun, becoming the aggressor and actively seeking the zombies out. Come on over here! Come on over here! No, you flipped me off! Come on, coward! No, no, no! Come on! You're not an intellectual! You're a fake and a fraud! Revelations. The basic bitch move is to say, the visuals, and, I mean, this map does look gorgeous probably the prettiest thing Call of Duty's ever made. Yet there's a really neat idea here that I feel often gets overlooked. The super easter egg reward. No, 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 not the RK5. The Wisp. During the quest, a Wisp will spawn that, should you manage to take it to Samantha's room without getting hit, will unlock the Path of Sorrows in the temple, and make every gun in the box pack a punch for the remainder of the match. I think it'd be neat if every map had a little reward like this for doing the quest, alongside things like Director's Cut and The Pact. Zombies in Spaceland. The quote-unquote playground approach to this map's gameplay is unlike anything we've seen before or since in Zombies. There's always some fun little activity to do, rewards to earn, and even games to play if you just want to kick back for a second. Jimmy Zielinski described Moon as the ultimate Zombies playground, but Spaceland is that idea fully realized. Raven the Redwoods. I love the aesthetic this map has going on. I grew up with cheesy horror franchises like Friday the 13th and... Okay, maybe the original wasn't cheesy, but those Halloween sequels. So to have a map that emulates the vibe found in those, while also adding a wonderful dash of color through rave mode, is right up my alley. Shaolin Shuffle. You can pop every single balloon in the Disco Inferno. I kid, I kid. Although that is a cute little detail. No, the thing I really want to highlight here is the Katana, which held the crown as the best zombies melee weapon ever made. Until the Crystal Axe came along, and that's only because Cold War Zombies has a health cap, whereas Infinite Warfare does not. So unfortunately, the Katana can drop off in effectiveness eventually, whereas the Crystal Axe cannot. I gotta say though, the Katana definitely has a beat in terms of pure satisfaction. God, that's fantastic. Attack of the Radioactive Thing. The vintage monster movie vibe, from the black and white visuals at the start of the game to the muffled sound, to the basic, silly design of the mad wonder weapon, to the Krogs, and by extension, the most important thing about the entire map, Krogzilla, this map nails the vibe they're going for and has a ton of charm. The Beast from Beyond Sure, the way it handled extinction from a story standpoint may have been my least favorite series continuation ever, until this one and this one. But it did get one thing related to Extinction right, the Venom X. The updated model and FX set on the base weapon are really well done, and the upgraded one actually feels like a natural extension of the Venom variants we saw in Extinction's DLC. Those variants included fire and lightning, and this weird little cedar turret, so it's only natural that we get an ice one as well. It fits from an aesthetic stance too, since the map is stationed on an icy moon. Just a really neat inclusion overall. But we're not done with Beast. Nah, I want to talk about Director's Cut as well. Or more specifically, Mephistopheles. This boss fight is absolutely fantastic. No japes. Zombies famously has really, really, really terrible boss fights. But this one is so good. Primarily because Mephistopheles is the actual threat, not the fucktillion zombies the game spawns in. He has a very aggressive, dangerous moveset that can kill you super quickly if you don't pay attention. But each move also has obvious tells and counterplay. For his fireballs, slide at just the right time to avoid them. For the black hole, get behind a pillar. For the fire tornado, watch where it splits and position yourself in a safe place. You get the idea. And as the fight goes on, he gets access to more and more of these moves. So there's an actual feeling of escalation here until it all culminates in that one final bid to stop you where he summons literally everything he can throw at you. It's a tough fight, but one that never feels like bullshit. If you died, it's probably on you, which is a good thing. Bosses that require you to learn their moveset and actually pay attention to win are just good game design. Bosses that are designed to insta-kill you on that first run because the director wants you to die instantly and then go through an hour-long quest to get there again are not. We knew the electricity was going to kill everyone on the first time. Right. Like, but excellent. We, That's going to be the moment. It's mm. going to be the tease because then everyone has to reset and then talk about it right, and then right. get to it again. And, you know, it's, that was a very conscious choice to say, okay they've got this far, let's tease them and show the visual, and then they're gonna have to move away right, and think right. about it again. So. I literally cannot believe he admitted that with a straight face. 
the prologue, and Grusten House. My favorite part of both of these experiences is the sound design. Being all alone in the woods at night listening out for something just out of sight, and then later being trapped in a small house with zombies closing in, is already spooky. But just hearing zombie footsteps on the floorboards above you, or their weird Thulean speech just outside the house, is super effective and makes for a really creepy, atmospheric little experience. The Final Reich. Another map where I am… a bit disheartened that I can only pick one thing. But if I have to focus on one standout, it'd be the two different quest paths. A casual guided path so that newer players can keep up with the story, and a tougher one that builds off of the base of the easier one and rewards you with a slightly extended ending. I understand this practice couldn't keep going due to the ever-present time and budget constraints that Zombies constantly faces, and while the execution may not have been perfect here, it was a great compromise for the two different parts of the community. The online crowd that wants the quest to be difficult with no real guidance, and normal human beings. The Darkest Shore Call of Duty really doesn't put a lot into its dismemberment. When a body part is taken off or a person blows up, the transition between the normal and jibbed model is usually covered by a comically huge blood splatter, or even worse, they just slap a poorly UV'd blood decal on the model. Good lord, guys. While the former can certainly look cool, you never really buy it, especially if you have those autistic eyes that let you see through the smoke and mirrors. The Corpse Gate is something I thought would follow this exact pattern, but to my genuine shock, this dude gets pulled apart, completely unobscured by video game trickery. The way this was achieved was by modeling the inside of the character to resemble a human, adding a few bits of helper gore, stitching it back together, and then having all those insides just fall out during the animation. And also spawning in an extra intestine model right as the character splits for good measure. It's so wonderfully disgusting and unsettling and technically unnecessary when you could have just done all those tricks I mentioned earlier. But holy shit was it worth the effort, because regardless of your thoughts on the map, that visual ain't leaving your head anytime soon. The Shadowed Throne There's a lot of little things to love about the Shadowed Throne, from the horrifying sound design of the Gekok, to the Wonderbus, to the absolutely wicked design of the Stottjäger, but the main thing to stand out to me are the map's unique melee weapons. They all feel great to use, and their unique abilities help them fit into different styles of play. But most importantly, they have wonderful, wonderful execution animations. Mwah! Beautiful stuff. The Tortured Path. My affinity for melee weapons has become pretty obvious throughout this video, so it should come as no surprise that I love the Sword of Barbarossa. It's a really fun, absurdly powerful weapon with a ton of special abilities most of which break the game's balance entirely. But none are more important than the fact that you can launch a stun bomber to nuke a crowd. <laughs> that is the stupidest fucking thing I've ever seen. Oh, that rocks. The Frozen Dawn. I love the God King boss fight. It's not as good as Mephistopheles, but the way it forces the player to really understand the ins and outs of all those special weapons you gain through the quest is super cool. For example, the God King's firewall can only be bypassed by the teleportation of the Moonraven Flail. The purple shields on zombies can only be broken by the Stormraven Hammer. The empowered zombies can be used to charge up the cheat death ability of the Deathraven Scythe. And the blood plates around the arena can be filled up to provide temporary safety with the Bloodraven Shield. Not enough maps really take advantage of the special weapons like this. Like, does anyone remember that piece of intel about the Chrysalax in Cold War where Sparagma says, Hey, you idiots are gonna need this thing to kill the Forsaken, and then you can do the entire Forsaken boss fight without using the Chrysalax once? That little part always bugged me. Voyage of Despair. I love the efforts they went to to accurately recreate the Titanic. Seriously, go explore the map in theater mode sometime. There's such wonderful attention to detail in everything, from the more obvious stuff like general architecture of the ship, to even the simplest things like the kind of luggage and cutlery that would have been on board the ship in the time. Nine or as IGN called it, Eleven, the boss fight with Fury and Wrath. The quest itself isn't great, but this fight is so wonderfully executed. The boss theme being an in-universe presentation by the Order's cultists, the mountains of gladiator support units, and the sheer scale of the war elephants themselves makes for one of the coolest boss fights in Zombies, and always leaves me with a smile on my face after the quest. Seriously, I always forget about all the bad parts of this quest after the fight. It's a nice little palate cleanser. Dead of the Night. I didn't even have to think about this one. It's the Brigadier. He's such a goddamn goofball, even in the most harrowing situations, and the casting of Brian Blessed was literal perfection. Look at the size of that thing! 
Whatever else happens tonight, that fucker's head gets mounted on my wall. Reject grimdark characters. Embrace those that radiate absolute goddamn silliness. Ancient Evil. The main quest. I like it a lot. Honestly. The steps make sense. None of them are horribly obnoxious, except for the raw defense step and solo play. There's some nice twists and turns throughout. The boss fight is really neat. And that hit your mark step is a fun little palette cleanser after the raw defense. Honestly, it's just a surprisingly solid quest all around. Classified. Samantha finally getting a significant appearance in a map for the first time since Origins, with Julie Nathanson returning to voice the character, was really neat. She's the one that sets the map's events in motion, she frequently talks to the cast through wisps and easter eggs around the map, and she'll even start shit-talking Richtofen during gameplay after you make it to Groom Lake. Fire. Blood of the Dead. The polished cinematic presentation of everything here is wonderful. From the early game catwalk rush to the multiple main quest IGCs, it all makes it feel like you're playing through a meticulously crafted movie. And I mean that in a good way. A very good way. Alpha Omega. This one is weird because I really don't like the map itself, but it's like the prime example of the map itself is bad, but there's so many good things inside of it. So I'm just gonna break format here and list like five or six things I love if that's okay with you. The new animation and effect set for the Galvanuckles. Every single Mark II variant is easy to get and super fun to use. Ultimus and Primus' interactions feel like fanfiction come to life and I am fucking here for it. Ted returns as a wisecracking lounge attendant. And of course, how could I forget? My main man Rushmore. Oh, that's sweet. I love you too. I love all of them. But don't get confused. I'm not exactly available. I'm already in a committed relationship with America. God, he's wonderful. Togged or totin. All right, I'm going to get a little bit sentimental here for a second, so bear with me. That final shot is so goddamn powerful, and that's all because of one tiny little thing. The player actually has to move Samantha and Eddie forward. If you don't, they'll stand there forever. But what makes this so impactful is that by the time you get to this shot, everyone else in the story has resigned themselves to their fate. So in keeping with the map's theme of letting go and moving on, the only one left to ask that of is you. You have to be the one to let this world and characters go, finally pushing them forward into that better tomorrow Richtofen so often spoke of. It is such a wonderful, impactful moment to end the story off on, especially powerful for those of us that have been around since the beginning. D Machina. I had plenty of reservations going in, but I adore how this map soft rebooted the series. It managed to respectfully continue the Aether story while also retroactively adding to it by finally exploring the place below creation, or better known as the Dark Aether. It's a place where nothing is ever really made sense. Structures from all sorts of time periods coexist with one another, large clusters of crystals populate the lands, and all sorts of creatures dwell within, from the giant ordas, to the ghost monkeys, to even ethereal jellyfish. This map was an absolutely perfect way to soft reboot the series after it had gotten so alienating to casual audiences, and paved the way for Cold War to become the most successful zombies entry in years. At least for normal human beings. It didn't do so well here on YouTube. Huh. I wonder why that is. Firebase C. I've always held this map in high regard, much to the confusion of those around me. But the one thing that I love the most out of all of it is the return of the game over laugh. I really have those soy bugman reactions that a lot of YouTubers have to pretty much everything, but this was one of the few times I totally did. I played my first match with a friend, and when we died and I heard that laugh, I instantly felt like the critic in Ratatouille. Nostalgia is a hell of a drug. Outbreak. This one was hard, since it's like seven different maps in one Brazilian objectives, but if I had to narrow it down to one standout, it'd have to be the Legion fight. I'll be the first to admit that this fight suffers from a lot of the negative aspects of other zombies boss fights, like Legion itself not being all that threatening, but the fight is just so chaotic that I can't help but have a ton of fun with it. Plus, I know it might be controversial, I really love the inclusion of that timer, mainly because it's purely there to fuck with you. What I mean by that is, if you look at it objectively, that timer is actually super, super generous. As long as you're decently on top of things, you can fail to break the orbs three times and still have Legion dead with almost a minute to spare. Despite knowing this though, that timer, alongside the mountain of ranged heavies, still gets to me sometimes and I think that's kinda neat. Mauer der Toten our robotic companion, Klaus. 
He's yet another Civil Protector reskin from a gameplay stance, but he more than makes up for that by being a consistently entertaining, sassy, and genuinely funny presence throughout the experience. You just love giving orders, don't you? Get my lunch, shine my shoes, stop a fucking train! I'll admit to being a bit biased here though because I have an unexplainable affinity for robot and AI characters. I don't know what it is about them, but ever since I was a kid back in the early 1940s, they've always come across as effortlessly endearing to me and way more fun to follow than their fleshy counterparts. And Klaus here is no different. Shame the poor guy couldn't make it. Oh, fuck. Forsaken. Oh boy, here's another one where I cheat and pick two things. To be fair, I did warn you about right here. First off, the Chrysalax. A melee weapon so busted, it turns the map into a complete cakewalk, dealing a massive 60,000 damage if both swipes connect. For reference, the absolute highest that normal zombie health can go is 60,000. And if that wasn't incredible enough, it comes with area denial capabilities and can transform into a powerful SMG that occasionally causes zombies to explode into a pink mist. This thing exceeds the overpowered tier and goes into the downright goofy tier. And second, the ending. Zombies has famously had pretty much nothing but shit endings. Togged or Totens was great, but there's exceptions to every rule. Forsaken doesn't reach those heights, but it does do a great job of wrapping up this game's narrative while also leaving just enough questions for us to mull over while we wait for the next game. Like, what is Project Janus? What exactly is Dr. Peck planning in Japan? Why was one of Samantha's hoodies on Elizabeth's clothes rack in her office? What's gonna happen to the strike team? <laughs> I'm just kidding, no one cares about that. And the cherry on top? All of it was scored to We'll Meet Again by Vera Lynn, as a pretty on the nose way of assuring the audience, hey, this one isn't gonna get shit canned like chaos. Forsaken may be an imperfect experience, but goddamn did it end on a high note. Garon Fong. Say what you will about this map, and believe me, I certainly have, but the art direction of this one is fucking immaculate. From the moonlit, bombed out Stalingrad, to the fiery windmill of Normandy, to the eerie red glow of the containment spell lighting Shinonuma, each area feels distinct and evokes a feeling of classic World at War era zombies, with a little bit of demonic goofiness thrown in for good measure. Terra Maledicta. I love comically overpowered wonder weapons. I love characters that are so silly they threaten to alter the genre of whatever they're in. Put those two together and you have the Decimator's Shield. Dark Thunder! <laughs> a lot of people look at it and say it's just the Gorod Krovy Shield again, and they're not wrong to an extent. It produces a blast that insta-kill zombies at any round, sure. But unlike the Guard of Fafnir, God, I'm such a fucking dork for remembering that name. The blast is this massive 360 degree bubble around the player, and it goes through level geometry, meaning you could be on the second floor of a building, pop the shield blast, and kill everything downstairs and outside the building. It also can instantly kill Sturmkriegers and Zabala, even at health cap. All this and the only penalty is a simple 30 second cooldown. Fuck this thing rocks. Shinonuma. Again, I've always been a Shinonuma fanboy, even back in the old days where I got left behind in favor of Doris and Verukt. But Vanguard takes the map I loved and manages to make me love it even more. Aside from new mechanics like Covenants, the biggest contributor to that is the addition of the Dig Site. Not only is it a fun little area to kite zombies around in, but it makes the overall map design flow even better by connecting these two little arenas together. Quite often, it really is the little things that make a map flow as well as it does. And last but not least, we have Terra Maledicta, but green. The best part of this one by a long shot is the introduction of the Construct, which adds a lot of mystery to the Dark Aether universe. For those unfamiliar, strap in because I'm about to spurg out on ya, the Construct is this all-powerful monolith that's been around since the dawn of time, existing alongside the Keepers, including Monty and Shadow Man. Unlike those two though, it doesn't just talk a boatload of shit constantly, it actually could wipe out reality in an instant. Yet it's chosen not to for reasons even the most knowledgeable historians of Belakar the Mommy's clan could deduce. It seemingly has never had any real agenda, and didn't mind sticking to the corners of reality while Monty, Shadow Man, and 935 constantly fucked over reality. While that was going on, it kinda just watched the show, never intervening in any way. The only time it does do anything is when a worthy candidate approaches it in a bid for power. Should it find them worthy, it'll bestow upon them a fraction of its power and the title of Archon, allowing them to do whatever they want with said power, provided they follow the rules it sets forth. 
The idea of zombies having this godlike entity that doesn't communicate with humans and has no real agenda is super interesting, mainly because our previous god figures have all been pretentious, annoying assholes. But this thing just feels like if Death Note's Ryuk was a big funny rock. And didn't have the endless charm of that character, of course. They're also clearly setting this thing up to be an active element of the next title. And you know what? I cannot wait to see what Richtofen's stupid ass is going to try and do with it. And there we have it. Something I love about each map. Like I said, I like zombies a very normal amount. But really, this video wasn't hard to write for at all. Every single map had something to offer that instantly stuck out to me while jotting down notes. And honestly, I think that's what makes zombies so special. Its actual quality is all over the place. I don't think anyone will argue that. But there's always something cool that sticks out even in the worst experiences. Well, that's all for today. If you enjoyed and would like to see more, well, I haven't exactly made a video like this before per se, but I do have a bunch of in-depth individual map reviews on my channel. If you want to give those a watch, links will be down in the description below. I'd also like to hear in the comments what little things you love about zombies as well, because as fun as it is to take the piss out of the mode, we're all here because we love zombies. Or loved in some cases. Anyway, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.